of the most selfish people I know. <laughs> That's why I've spent most of the last 14 years sleeping in tents and shitting in holes in some of the most difficult places on earth, all because I was looking for ways to make a difference in the lives of others. By being hands-on and eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball with the people I'm trying to help, I get to learn things, and feel things, and experience. And that's the fullness in life. And that's what I mean by being selfish. 14 years ago, I decided to stop working, at least making money. I only ever made money so that I could have choices in life. And then it's a matter of what you do with those choices. My choice was to try to reapply more or less the same skill set I used to make money to make a difference. Knowing how to smell bullshit, knowing how to hire the right people, making a plan, doing deals, and just generally knowing how to get stuff done. Because making a difference in the lives of others is too important not to get right. So I didn't come to philanthropy because I felt guilty that I had made too much money. I wasn't struck by a bolt of lightning making me want to kind of give back to society. It wasn't an uh, emotional knee-jerk reaction to seeing suffering. There's no kumbaya here. There's no sentimental filter. I'm not really a do-gooder. I'm a doer who's figured out that making a difference in the lives of others is a way for me and my family to live very full lives. So the way that we help people in our foundation is to never give a handout. We always expect them to have skin in the game. We don't do charity. Charity makes people feel bad about themselves, and it's not really uh, sustainable. You may have heard the very old observation that it's always better to give a hungry man or woman a fishing pole and teach him how to fish, rather than to simply give him a fish and he'll eat that fish and be hungry again tomorrow. But we take that logic one step further, because unless you also teach that person how to sell the fish, all he's ever going to be able to do is eat fish. So we're trying to empower people, not simply help them. So 14 years ago, my wife Elaine and I took our uh, little kids, at the time age uh, nine and six, out of school. This is in the year 2000. We took them out of school. We hired two teachers. And we started to live in communities around the world uh, that we wanted to try to help. Uh, countries that include uh, Nepal and Rwanda and Pakistan and many, many others. And the idea was to live close enough to the ground and long enough so that we could really listen, so that we didn't walk into a community and simply say to them, we've decided what's good for you and you know, here's the program we're going to sort of drop in your lap. Now, something like 36 or so trips later, we still talk to the kids about the difference between snorkeling and scuba diving, between just being on the surface, looking at something, versus being really fully submerged. Here's um, my daughter, uh, Tess, and I in a conversation with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. But here's our son Shane saying, who is this guy, and wake me up when it's over. <laughs> so my kids, and this is a very, very important point for me, my kids didn't have the benefit, the benefit that my wife and I had of growing up without money. So often we see money disabling people. We wanted to take our money and expose the kids to the world to help them be more grateful and more sympathetic to others, to live outside their bubble and the distorting filters that come with the bubble of distance uh, and money. So this is a camp that we all lived in in Pakistan. This is after the historic earthquake in the northwest frontier province that 
uh, where three million people lost their homes and something like 80,000 people died. The destruction was absolutely staggering. But here's that same camp where a group of families have set up little front yards searching for that shred of human dignity. But these kids, heartbreaking to see kids living such an unbelievably brutal life. But in the same day, in the same camp, this boy, so proud of his little toy, when you have nothing, almost anything makes you happy. These are my kids, Tess and Shane, walking through that camp. And whenever I look at this photograph, I think of Mark Twain's advice about never letting schoolwork get in the way of your education. <laughs> I took this photograph uh, of this little girl just about two weeks after her whole village had been destroyed. You can fake a smile with your mouth, but you can never fake a smile with your eyes. These three kids live in a bombed out part of Kabul, Afghanistan. You can see in this first moment uh, with them the kind of the distance, even the, the sadness and the suspicion in their eyes. This is just a moment later. And the only difference between the first photograph and the second is me going like this. <laughs> making myself vulnerable, stripping away filters, and creating the opportunity for real connection. This guy who lives in the Northwest Frontier Province in Pakistan looked like he kind of wanted to beat me up when I first saw him. But again, just a moment later, the opportunity for friendship. And a world away in Rwanda, first moment, second moment, when you look into the eyes of the people that you're trying to help and feel their humanity and let them feel yours and let them know that they're important enough for you to be there, you just change all the math. This little girl lives in Kathmandu, and again, a moment later. Turns out with both photography and philanthropy, most of the time, the closer you get, the better the result. So very often people say, when I'm talking to them, you know what, easy for you to say you have resources and so forth, but what am I supposed to do? The, the world is so screwed up. I can't make any real difference. It's kind of a default mechanism. I can't really move the needle so I don't really have to feel that bad about not trying. But I'd ask you to consider the power of something that I call concrete baby steps. And there's lots of examples of concrete baby steps, but it could be as simple as providing somebody internet access, or a computer, or being a mentor, or serving on a committee, or just giving people hope. So the idea is that if I do my concrete baby steps, and you do yours, and you do yours, and we all do ours, that cumulatively, when you add all those up, that may be the very best way we have of creating real, sustained change. I can't tell you, you know, what you're supposed to do. Everybody has their own uh, passions. But I know that cumulatively, it doesn't work cumulatively unless we're all actually doing it. So there's no, there's no spectator sport here. Everybody has to engage however, wherever, and whenever they can. And to make the point about concrete baby steps, and this is not my idea, this, I heard another speaker say this, and it's always really resonated with me. He asked the audience, do you know how many seeds are inside an apple? Anybody, any ideas? Any guess? Eight, six, two. 
Okay, the point is, I have no idea how many seeds are inside an apple, but I, can, I know how to find out. I cut the apple in half, I can count the seeds real easy. But to the point of concrete baby steps, while you can know how many seeds are inside an apple, you can never know how many apples could one day come from one of those seeds, how many trees, and even how many orchards. So we go and we plant the seeds. My family and I had the great honor of spending time with Nelson Mandela at his home in Johannesburg. We were sitting in his living room, and he was sitting in a big chair, and the four of us were just sort of huddled around him. And my daughter said, Madiba, you are such a hero to my mother and father. I was wondering, who are some of your heroes? Not a bad question for a nine-year-old. And Madiba took Tessa's hand and looked at her and said, my heroes are not presidents of countries or prime ministers or cabinet ministers. It is someone who has declared war on poverty, on illiteracy and disease, and is prepared to give human beings hope that there is a future for him or her. It is all those everyday people that decide to make a difference in the lives of others, those are my heroes. We can all be the heroes that Nelson Mandela so admired. Three months ago, last week, I came within a minute or two of being burned to death in my house. I could never have known when I went to sleep that night, when I put my head on the pillow, that I'd be fighting for my life just a few short hours later. It's made me think a lot about the idea that we pretty much take tomorrow for granted. But tomorrow may never come. How does that impact how we live all of our todays? Gratitude is as critical to life as breathing. How do we make our days more vivid? How do we fill them with optimism? and wonder. I took this picture in Afghanistan about maybe two months or so after September 11th. Her village had been bombed and her face uh, burned. And I'd ask you to consider along the lines of gratitude. What did you and I get pissed off at today? Think about it. And think about how it compares to her daily challenges. It's really hard to be happy unless you're thankful. And it's difficult to be thankful without some context to appreciate what you have. A little girl like this provides us context on steroids. The hope in her eyes is her gift to us. A light to ignite our optimism, perhaps even our action. Hope is the most important thing that people need to move forward. Some people say, you know, what are you talking about? Giving people hope sounds like this, this soft and cuddly cliche. But from my experience, hope is strategic. Hope is a lifeblood. Hope isn't just nice. Hope is a game changer. I'm going to show you a very quick video. This is actually an excerpt from a, a much longer video of photographs that are in my book which is called The Power of the Invisible Sun. The invisible Sun is a metaphor for hope. These kids live down alleyways, they live in remote villages, they in some cases live in war zones. They're child soldiers, refugees, and just plain kids living unimaginably difficult lives. The music is from Sting, his song, Invisible Sun. I feel bad for these kids. They don't want your pity. I didn't show you these images today, so you'd say, oh, look at those poor kids. I want to give them a hug. Hopefully, you take strength from their strength. You feel more thankful in your own lives. And there's no free lunch here. In return for that thankfulness and that strength, you go find ways to give other people hope. Not just by giving money, but by giving something of yourselves. If you find ways to nourish yourself, then you want to keep on helping others. 
The more you serve yourself, the more you'll serve others. It's kind of like the more selfish you are, the more people get helped. Just touched by an angel kind of momentary helping maybe makes you feel good, but it's not sustainable. And sustainable is all that matters in the world of making a difference in the lives of other people. While you change the world, you can change yourself. And while you change yourself, you can change the world. So I'd end by saying, be selfish. Go help someone, because you'll learn more, feel more, and be more. Be selfish, go help someone, because all our concrete baby steps added together can change the world. So it's enough with all the talk. Let's all just go fucking do it. Thank you. Just a sec. Because uh, you brought some reminders uh, for us. Yes. But there's a story to go with that, sure. right? Here's a child soldier in Rwanda. He killed three people in the Congo before he was seven years old and another two before he was nine. His name is Moses. I met him at a rehabilitation camp in the northern part of Rwanda uh, near Uganda. This is his soccer ball made from rubbish and a condom and just tied together with string. This is an indestructible soccer ball. You can stab it like this, and it won't break. You can step on it. We've driven trucks over it. Elephants tried to step on it and break it. This is a great example of a concrete baby step because when we distribute these balls, and remember, we never give anyone a handout. They have to earn the balls by going through a, a, a program that uses football to teach life skills. But the point is, in a world where everything they touch crumbles, here's something that they can rely on. And when I was distributing these balls to these child soldiers a few years later in another child soldier camp, I said to them, imagine, think about the fact that since this is indestructible, since this will be in your life for a very long time, that one day you'll play football with your sons and daughters with this same ball, that you'll start to imagine a future, a possibility, the light at the end of the tunnel. So I brought these balls today uh, to share with some of you. And for whoever receives one of these balls, remember, I don't do handouts, the deal is, you have to, right now in your head, pledge to yourself that you're going to do something different today or tomorrow than you did before you came into this hall. And if you're not prepared to do that, give the ball to someone else. Okay, thank you everyone, thank you.